Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the stage from Radio IQ of meteorologist Nick Gilmore. What y'all think of the movie? He was even like just creeping in that barn. Where did he come from? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's a little creepy. Uh, good, good evening, everybody. Thank you so much again for having me. I am Radio IQ meteorologist Nick Gilmore. I have been with the station for about eight years now. We've had plenty of tornado days in that time. Not necessarily so many confirmed tornadoes, but we've had plenty of tornado warnings. I just say all that to say, you know, tornadoes can happen anywhere. We had one even in Salem, I, it was either last month or the month before. I, it, it, that's pretty mountainous, so it can happen anywhere. So what we're gonna talk about this evening, tornadoes, we're gonna learn a little bit about their development. We're gonna talk about what this movie gets right and what this movie gets wrong. And uh, I'll be honest, I made a little presentation and you'll, you'll see it here in a minute. Uh, I made it before I got to see the movie though. I was basing it, because I was like, I didn't know how much time I was going to have before this. And I was like, I was basing it off the original Twister, which is not the most accurate. It's great. We love it. Cult classic. Not the most accurate. But then I got to see the movie, and I was just like, there are some real life things in this movie. It's incredible. So we're going to talk about that tonight. Uh, also wanted to mention, I graduated from Virginia Tech. I'm sorry, don't. Uh, <laughs> okay, okay, all right. I like Tony Bennett for those that are you. Yeah. All right. There we go. There we go. Oh, what? Cl closer. Closer. Okay, thank you. I was like, I don't know what that symbol means, but. <laughs> um, and I actually for. My, uh, my undergraduates, we got to do a field study experience. We got to go out in the plains and chase tornadoes for a couple of weeks. So I do have a little bit of experience in this area. I don't still do that now, uh, but it is, is, I don't recommend driving into a tornado. It's not, not a great idea. So let's start off with talking a little bit about tornado formation. Can we get the, the uh, PowerPoint thing? Okay, all right, that's fine. Because I, I just want to get through all of this so that we have time for some questions, because I'm sure you all have some. Uh, but basically, the, the basics of meteorology, and it works for tornadoes, it works for thunderstorms, we're all trying to find rising air. Have you all ever heard the saying, if it, must, if it goes up, it must come down, right? So say it with me, it must go up, it must it come down. down. You're all meteorologists now, congratulations. Yeah. That's what it's all about. And thunderstorms are actually, that principle is kind of in miniature. Thunderstorms have an updraft, that's the ascending air and then they have a downdraft that's the air coming back down to the surface most of the time with the downdraft that's where your precipitation is going to be the rain the hail again what goes up must come down so that's what we're looking for in the field of meteorology okay jumping ahead to severe thunderstorms the difference with them is they're called supercells and the updrafts in those storms are rotating that's what makes them unique so what causes a storm's updraft to rotate it's called wind shear, and you probably heard that in the movie. They talked about it a little bit. So when I heard that, I was just like, that's, that's a real life thing. It's crazy how that works. Wind shear is basically the change of wind speed or direction as you go up into the atmosphere. So say here at the surface, we've got 20, 30 mile per hour winds. You go up 100 feet in the air, it's 50, 60 miles per hour. It's coming from a different direction. All of that comes together to make the storm start to rotate. What causes a tornado to form? Have the rotating updraft, it meets the rotating downdraft, all that spinning action basically is what causes the tornado to happen. You don't get a tornado until the funnel cloud touches the ground. That was mentioned in the movie too. So uh, we're, we're accurate off of that. So I just wanted to give you a little bit about tornado formation before you know we start talking and tearing this movie apart. Okay? <laughs> Let's start with what the movie gets wrong. Right off the bat, I think it was the first line in the movie. It talks about how Doppler radar is showing that in 15 minutes, we're gonna have storms starting to fire. And does anybody know what radar actually does? Shout it out. Shows you what's there already. That's right, it's not a predictive tool. There are predictive weather models for sure. And Doppler radar, there are some, you know, uh, some algorithms, some fancy computer programs that do show you some things. But ultimately, it's a real-time tool. It's not something that is like, oh, 15 minutes from now, you're gonna 
figure out what is going on. That's not what it's about. So when I first saw that, I was like, oh, this movie, what am I about to get into? <laughs> but it was pretty good, it was pretty good. So, yeah, if you just wanna jump ahead to the slide that talks about what it gets wrong, that would be great. Uh, one more. Oh, the other way. Okay. <laughs> one more? There we go. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's talk about the, the key plot point in this movie. And that is this idea that you can maybe stop a tornado. I don't want to, I'm not going to say it's not impossible. Okay. I don't want to start off throwing that out there because feasibly you suck up enough moisture, you stop the updraft, you do kill the storm theoretically. But just think about this in, uh, from a logistical standpoint. Okay. Just imagine for a typical thunderstorm, we're talking tons and tons of water. She also talked about converting the humidity in the atmosphere to water and sucking that up as well. They would, you would have to have so much more than what they showed in the movie of, uh, of all these trail or the, tr the material to suck up all that moisture. It just would be so much more than you possibly could imagine. Yeah, because at one point he says, you need a silo's worth, and then they yeah. have the stuff on the back, and it's like, eh, that's it's a not even small silo. Yeah. <laughs> so we've got that problem. Yeah. Number two, just think about, so a tornado outbreak earlier this year, it, it spanned five different states over the span of five different days like 125 tornadoes with it. So you, you have to think you're getting multiple tornadoes at once. Just think, we have to have a team in front of every single tornadic supercell. It's just not feasible. It, it's a great idea in practice, but I just don't think it would work in the day to day, you know what I'm saying? And finally, you know, you have to talk about the overall environment well, as well. Just because, let's say for devil's advocate, you can kill one tornado. That's great, we love it but that doesn't really handle the conditions that led to that tornado developing. You've got instability, you've got warm, moist air, you've got the wind shear. Those are kind of like regional conditions. So it's like if you kill one tornado, you're still gonna have to talk about the rest of the environment, the rest of the regional kind of conditions. I just don't think it would be feasible to do that on a big scale. Maybe someday though, that would be great. Um, right at the beginning of the movie, she literally says, the worst statement you can do is to, to hide under an overpass. And then they do it. I'm just like, what are we doing? <laughs> what are we doing? You just said it. And uh, so maybe this should go into like a maybe category because it's like it showed you exactly what that does. And it makes sense. You know, you're out in the field. You have nowhere else to go. The highway overpass is there. It makes sense. It's like, oh, that's, that's the only shelter that I have. That's what I have to go for. But as you saw in the movie, it just asked, acts as a, as a wind tunnel, basically. It just sucks you right out of there. It's the worst thing to do. Don't do that. Um, and believe it or not, most storm chasers don't drive straight into tornadoes. <laughs> They're just dangerous. I don't know what to tell you. Um, I think a couple years ago, there was a storm chaser TV show. I think that's where a lot of people get that from. So if you've ever seen that show, the Dominator, the Tib on that show, they have these little have anchors like what they showed in this movie but those are like more perpendicular to the ground the one that you saw in this movie it just digs straight down it just augers into the ground and all that would do was just loosen the dirt that the anchor is going into so it's really not it's not that helpful as you kind of saw towards the end there when the truck started to move so that's what this movie gets right let's go to the next slide or it gets wrong let's talk a little bit about what it gets right uh, go back one more, sorry. There you go. So cloud seeding, uh, that is an actual thing that uh, in the Dakotas, they actually do that to try to get um, supercells to not develop hail so that the hail in the storm becomes rain and it falls on the crops. And hail would be bad for sensitive crops, so they actually do that in real life. Um, you heard about hay and breaking the path and wind shear, we talked about that a little bit. Uh, Kate is convective available potential energy. It's a very fancy uh, algorithm and it, I was shocked to hear that in this movie. But it is a real life thing and basically it's just a measure of instability. That is basically the ability for uh, warm air at the surface, how fast it's kind of rising into the atmosphere. Because again, it's all about the rising air, how fast it's doing it. So the higher cape level you have, just think of it as like a, a fuel source for the storms. The higher level you go, the more potential there is for some strong storms to develop. Uh, it talks about breaking the path. So that's basically, I talked about the warm air at the surface 
Sometimes you'll have like cloud coverage or a temperature inversion, we talked about that. And that's basically just an area of the atmosphere that is cooler than the air below it. And it just kind of keeps the air from, from rising. So that's, that's a real life thing too. Um, storms do fight for the best ingredients. Um, you'll see like line segments of storms, the storm at the bottom, it has the best access to that warm air and that moisture, the wind shear, or if you have a storm by itself, those typically are going to be the stronger storms because they don't have to fight any other storms for all of those ingredients. Um, I had to look this next one up, that phase, the PAR, phased array radar, that is a real life thing. And it's apparently cutting edge of radar research right now. And it, it, it kinda, kinda is like what they talked about in this movie. So current radar technology, you've probably mm -hmm. seen the little, the white domes, and it, it, all there is, there's a thing inside of it that just spins, it skins the atmosphere and it's just doing this. And typically those take a long time for the scan to go all the way around. There's a big area that it's trying to watch. Our phased array radars is basically, you know, you set a radar in one place and you could actually control what the radar is looking at. So in a severe thunderstorm kind of day, tornado day, if you see a storm that's particularly strong looking on radar, you can just look at that one storm. You don't have to wait for the radar beam to go all the way around. And that can be crucial when you're trying to save lives, get tornado warnings out to people so that they have the most amount of time to get ready for what is headed their way. Um, the Fujiwara effect, that is real. Um, I had to look that one up too. <laughs> but basically it's where a vortex, it, it happens a lot with hurricanes. It, let me rephrase that. It's pretty rare. It has been documented, but it is very, very rare. Typically when it has been seen, it's for hurricanes, but it has been documented with tornadoes too. It's basically an area of rotation, a vortex. <coughs> they kind of are following around two of them and they go around and around and eventually they just kind of come together, fused into one. Like I said, it has been documented, but it's very rare. Most of the time, if you have a multiple, if you see multiple funnels like it showed in the movie, that's basically just one tornado with multiple sub vortices or just areas of rotation. So technically tornadoes can merge, but it's really, really rare. So uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Uh, tornadoes do dissipate almost as quickly as they appear. That was pretty good in the movie as well. Uh, the enhanced Fujita scale, which is what you know you hear at EF1 and EF2, that is based off of the damage that a, a tornado does, and I don't think a lot of people realize that. Uh, uh, anytime the National Weather Service will, will issue a tornado warning, they have to send out a crew to look at all the damage. And so you hear the, the rating that comes after the fact. Most of the time it's a day or two before you really know how strong a tornado <coughs> was. So that was true. Um, there are three different types of supercells. You heard about the low precip precipitation type in the movie. Um, basically, that's all about precipitable water, which is basically just how much moisture is available in the atmosphere. Sometimes you'll have a low precipitation one, depending on how much moisture is in the air. Uh, rain wrap tornadoes are definitely a thing as well. Uh, that's basically where the storm is so strong that it's it's pulling the precipitation around the storm and it is particularly dangerous because you can't see the tornado when it happens that is real um we're going to jump ahead a little bit because i want to make sure that we get to questions i think both this movie and the original twister are really really good at showing you know the nature of storm chasers the community there are parts you know, early on in the movie where you see the gas station and everybody's just kind of hanging out ready to go for a storm, that looked exactly like you could have pulled it from my storm chasing trip. Because there are parts of the country where they just go and chase storms because that's what you do in Kansas. I don't know if you've ever been to Kansas, but there's not a lot going on in Kansas. <laughs> so they just chase storms. And so I thought that was really cool to see in this movie. It's very passionate, uh, a group of people that just love to see nature up close and personal. So. Uh, let's jump to the next slide, please. Uh, I just wanted to show some of the pictures. So at the top right here, that's a software program called GR Analyst, and it's just fancy radar tech. Uh, but it, I think it was pretty early in the movie, you, they actually showed that, so I was like, that's pretty cool. Uh, that software allows you to like see a 3D cross-section of a storm. You don't need the little Dorothy box, not necessary. We already have it, it's great. 
Uh, up here in the top right, we have, uh, it's called a mesoscale analysis. It's just a tool that meteorologists use to see that cape, that wind shear, like I was talking about. It's a real life thing at the Zoom movie as well. Uh, this down here at the bottom is called the Dow, and it's Doppler on wheels. I just wanted to put that there because the idea of putting a radar in front of a severe storm, well, that's been around for a little while. So I thought it was pretty cool to, to see that in the movie. Uh, if you want to jump to the next slide. <laughs> Up top is a low precipitation supercell. I just think this hailstone looks cool. <laughs> oh, and then that is the enhanced Fujita scale. It's just kind of, it's kind of hard to see, but I just wanted to give you an idea that it's based off of the damage uh, the season storms. Uh, next one. And then. Uh, just wanted to say, if I didn't answer your question, because we are kind of on a limited time, that website up top there, spc.noaa.gov, it looks like it's from like 2002, but it has like any question you have about tornadoes, it's go check it out. Uh, shout out to my friend Alex Thornton. He had, he's an actual storm chaser. He uses the Storm Cruiser. Uh, I highly encourage you to go find him on social media. He has a rhino lined truck. Um, it looks as cool as that sounds. Um, you should definitely check it out. And then shameless, po or shameless plug for me, Tom and Lex is the, uh, the weather and climate newsletter that I do for work. Uh, and I'm gonna try to do a deeper dive on this movie next week. So if you're not signed up already, wbtf.org slash Tom And it is an excellent newsletter. <laughs> I Thank subscribe. You. So questions, what, what do you wanna know? Right. I work for Aspen Tree, so we do a lot of storm work. Yeah. Uh, and down south, we get more hurricanes than anything. Okay. Do they put just as much effort in the tracking hurricanes and shit as it does tornadoes? Yeah. So there's actually a whole division of, I, I mean, I guess it's technically correct to call them storm chasers. I don't know if you've ever heard of the hurricane hunters, but they are this group. It's a joint mission between the National Weather Service and other NOAA partners. And basically all they do is fly these giant planes into hurricanes and they drop, they call it a radio sonde. It's just this fancy piece of tech that they drop into the hurricane and collects temperature, moisture, all that good stuff. So yes, there are, that is, there are hurricane chasers as well. There are hurricane chasers on the ground too that will follow a hurricane if it's coming on land somewhere, they'll definitely follow it, so. Right. Yeah, is there any cutting edge tornado research that you're excited about? Or is that like a thing? Uh, I actually didn't get to talk about it, but the whole idea of like why one particular supercell will drop a tornado and another one won't, that's something that we still really don't have a good grasp on. We're not so sure about how climate change will actually impact tornadoes. Obviously a warmer climate, you're gonna, a warmer climate is going to be able to hold more moisture but we're not really sure what the idea of wind shear is, how that's gonna change with a warming climate. And then most of the research right now, I would say, is it's all about trying to, to increase the lead time. So you get a tornado warning. Right now, the average is about 13 minutes from the time that a tornado warning is issued until the tornado is actually hitting you. And so it's, it's so important to try to, it doesn't seem like that much, but 13 minutes is really a lifetime to get as many people to safety as you possibly can. And so that's really where the, re the research is right now, is trying to increase that as much as possible. Has so that changed since the original Twister? Because in the, I just watched the first movie. I think it and has. And the says, we only had the three minute warning. Yeah, yeah. I think it's definitely, it's definitely gotten better, so. Much better. <laughs> yeah. At the beginning of the movie, Kate is in the, this huge control room. <laughs> yeah. With like, I don't know how many people were in there, but is that, what the weather control? Yeah, is there that? are. So I believe we're talking about the scene in the National Weather Service office. I guess. Yeah, yeah. And if you go to any National Weather Service office in this country, there's going to be a, a whole control center like that. Uh, especially so for like, you have your local National Weather Services offices, and then you also have like regional offices. They definitely are going to have all kinds of stuff. And then you have the Storm Prediction Center, which is like its own offshoot, it's, it's still part of the National Weather Service, but all they do is focus on severe weather. And so they definitely have kitted out and uh, are watching stuff like that all the time, so. Thank you. Yes. Is it true that there are more tornadoes occurring in the United States than anywhere else in the world? And if so, why is that? 
That is true. Um, I will. What do you think the second nation is behind the U.S.? It's a, Canada is basically because their season directly follows ours. Basically, uh, tornadoes are a pretty unique to the United States. You do get it in other parts of, of the world, but you've got a feature called the dry line, which sets up during the spring and summer months, and basically that is just. Uh, it's a forcing mechanism, so a lot of times, you'll, and it, it sets up in um, eastern Texas a lot of times. Sometimes it moves a little bit further west, but that is a big, it's just something that's unique to the geography there, and it, it causes a lot of these storms to fire. It's, it's the warm, moist air. We see that from the Gulf of Mexico coming in. It means colder air from Canada. So we're just kind of in a unique spot where you have all of these ingredients coming together, and it's just like we're the tornado capital of the world. So. Hopefully that answers your question. Yes. Oftentimes the tornadoes seem to happen on the on a front. Yeah. Is it the, um, the the tornado happened in the high pressure or the low pressure? So fronts are so the the dry line that I just mentioned. Fronts are basically another form of like a forcing mechanism. So you can have you have instability at the surface. You have a really warm day. The air is going to rise on its own. But if you have a front or the dry line, some sort of forcing mechanism, it's going to just further increase the rising air. It's all about the rising air, like I said. Um, you, what was the second part of your question? High pressure versus low pressure. Is one going over top of the other? Yeah, that's essentially what it is. So lower pressure, it, you, it's basically air is circulating into the low pressure, and it's got to go up. And a lot of times you'll see a low pressure will move closer to a high pressure system. And that interaction where the high pressure goes up over the low pressure, that, that interaction, interaction there is a lot of times where you'll see pretty active weather. So it's all about the, uh, the mixing, <laughs> basically, right. causing the air to rise. I think we, are we out of time? We have time for one more. We have time for one yeah. more. Here in the back. Um, you didn't mention a cloud scene in the film. Yeah. What are the That is a great question. Um, I, I, it works. It really does work. It seems to be able to cause a storm, for whatever reason, to rain. I, I don't know the, the fancy physics behind it, but I think in, oh gosh, where was it? I think they tried it in Dubai. I think they tried it not too long ago, and it caused all kinds of flooding. <laughs> it was so bad. and. We are essentially playing God. I think it's, you just have to, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that one. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I think it's just, you just have to be careful with it. Um, they do, I didn't look up the, the, the project in the Dakotas, but it seemed like it does seem to be working there for the crop season. But I, I would imagine it's super limited and it's very targeted in what they're trying to do. Um, I'd have to look into that a little bit more, but hopefully that answers your question. It does work. It does almost work too well. <laughs> so. But for a quick follow-up, what's your favorite weather movie? My favorite weather movie? Other than Twister. Other than Twister. Other than Twister. That's a good one. That's a good one. I feel like you gotta go after day after tomorrow. Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry. I mean, what's happening? Oh. Oh. The, the hail in that movie always freaks me out. Though. It just like hits the dude in the head. It's not like <laughs> Well, thank you all so much for being here. I really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope you've had a wonderful evening, and I hope you have a great weekend. Thank you so much.